the time of reporting her first vision at only 17 years old, Ellen Harmon was among a small company which would become the forebears of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Since that day in December 1844, Ellen White and her visions have been the subject of ridicule by her critics. Even contemporary Adventists denounced her as a fanatic. In fact, the editor of the Advent Herald said that her visions were the result of mesmeric operations, an early form of hypnotism. Today, suspicions have arisen over the obelisk planted at Ellen White's gravesite. Others claim that her visions were the result of a head injury she received in childhood, or simply that she was a charlatan. But to those who believe her, she is, as she claimed to be, a messenger of the Lord. There is a certain stigma attached to any person who claims direct inspiration from God. While this is not without cause, for many false prophets are gone out into the world, it's important to note that all who have borne a message from heaven have been derided by their contemporaries. Before his martyrdom, Stephen pointed this out to the unbelieving Jews by asking the rhetorical question, Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? Popular opinion offers no safeguard in determining a true or false prophet. Remember the words of Nicodemus before the Sanhedrin. Doth our Lord judge any man before it hear him, and know what he doeth? Before an accurate judgment can be made, we must allow Ellen White's own words and works to speak. For regardless of anyone's opinion, Ellen G. White is the most translated non-fiction female author of all time, as well as the most translated American author of either gender. Despite her formal education ending at only nine years of age, there are over 5,000 articles, 40 books and 50,000 pages of manuscript in her name. And yet, Ellen White never called herself a prophetess. She simply referred to her writings as the lesser light, which God had given to lead men and women to the greater light, which is the Bible. During a talk in 1901, she went as far as to say, I do not ask you to take my words. Lay Sister White to one side. Do not quote my works again as long as you live until you can obey the Bible. I exalt the precious word before you today. Do not repeat what I have said, saying, Sister White said this and Sister White said that. Find out what the Lord God of Israel says, and then do what he commands. If our foremost duty is to study and obey the Bible, it's fair to wonder why God would have us read the writings of a 19th century woman. Interestingly, Ellen White happened to answer this question herself. The word of God is sufficient to enlighten the most beclouded mind and may be understood by those who have any desire to understand it. But notwithstanding all this, some who profess to make the Word of God their study are found living in direct opposition to its plainest teachings. Then, to leave men and women without excuse, God gives plain and pointed testimonies, bringing them back to the Word that they have neglected to follow. Ellen White's mission was, in her own words, not to give new light, but to impress vividly upon the heart the truths of inspiration already revealed. But does the Bible grant us any way of determining whether Ellen White was a genuine messenger of the Lord? And can we even expect to see the gift of prophecy manifested in a modern age? In his letter to the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul compares the church to a human body comprised of many parts. Paul uses this analogy to illustrate how God has spread his gifts amongst the individual members of his church, which, when placed together, form that honourable and fruitful body of believers. 
In 1 Corinthians 12, 28, Paul lists some of those gifts. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. From this passage alone, it cannot be denied that the gift of prophecy serves as a member of the New Testament church body. Paul reiterates this principle in Ephesians 4, stating that after Christ's ascension, Jesus gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Why did Christ bestow these gifts upon his church? Verse 12 reveals that it was for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Each of these five gifts, prophecy included, is therefore vital to the equipping of God's end-time church. Although this passage bears particular reference to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, it is evident that the gift of prophecy is not restricted to the Old Testament era. On the contrary, the prophet Joel clearly reveals that God will pour out this gift in the end time. Speaking about that final period prior to Christ's second coming, Joel states, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. In light of these passages, it cannot be contested that the gift of prophecy is a legitimate avenue by which God can and will speak to his people today. This gift encompasses both men and women, for Joel gives specific mention to the daughters and handmaids who are recipients of the spirit of prophecy. Therefore, it would be unbiblical to dismiss a person solely on the basis that they claim to receive visions and messages from God. Of course, this is not to say that all such persons are to be believed. Far from it. In fact, this is why Ellen White never assumed the title of a prophetess. Why have I not claimed to be a prophet? Because in these days, many who boldly claim that they are prophets are a reproach to the cause of Christ. And because my work includes much more than the word prophet signifies. Ellen White was aware of the captivating yet deceptive influence of men who claimed to be prophets of God and yet were being used by Satan. It is due to the prevalence of these false prophets that God in his wisdom has provided clear biblical tests by which one may distinguish a true prophet from the enemy's counterpart. This is what it means to try the spirits as John instructs us. Beloved, Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. A true prophet of God is not a psychic. On the contrary, the Bible forbids the practice of mystical fortune-telling. Indeed, the book of Deuteronomy plainly states that the workings of astrologers, soothsayers, clairvoyants, and spirit mediums are an abomination to the Lord. Any person who participates in these activities can be denied the title of a true prophet of God, even if they claim to receive their messages from the Lord. Many psychics and seers, however, claim that they possess their own innate ability to connect with the spirit world, while others claim to simply see beyond the self-imposed limitations of the human mind. Persons belonging to either category are, according to this council, not true prophets of God. For one, the Bible states that the dead know not anything. Further, that his prophets spake not by their own ability, but as they were moved by the Spirit of God. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. 
For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. A true prophet cannot simply tune in to spiritual impulses on their own accord. On the contrary, a true prophet receives a message only when God ordains it, and they acknowledge that the prophetic gift is bestowed upon them by God and is not some indwelling power lying within themselves. So did Ellen White claim the power of prophecy as her own, or did she credit her visions and insights as being given to her by God? You might say that this communication was only a letter. Yes, it was a letter, but prompted by the Spirit of God to bring before your minds things that had been shown to me. In these letters which I write, in the testimonies I bear, I am presenting to you that which the Lord has presented to me. I do not write one article in the paper expressing merely my own ideas. They are what God has opened before me in vision, the precious rays of light shining from the throne. I am as dependent upon the Spirit of the Lord in writing my views as I am in receiving them. Ellen White openly testified that her thoughts were given to her by the Spirit of God. Speaking in the third person, she declared of her works. Sister White is not the originator of these books. They contain the instruction that during her life work, God has been giving her. They contain the precious, comforting light that God has graciously given his servant to be given to the world. Furthermore, Ellen White repeatedly condemned the spiritualistic practices outlined in Deuteronomy 18. An interesting example of this can be seen in her response to the wrapping or knocking phenomena of the 1840s, which is generally accepted to be the origin of modern spiritualism. In short, Kate and Margaret Fox were two sisters who lived in Hydesville, New York. It was 1848 when these women reportedly heard a tapping or knocking on the walls of their home, which they believed were messages from a spirit. The Fox sisters were allegedly able to respond to or talk back to the knocking. They later discovered that a murder victim had been buried in the cellar of their home and thereafter claimed that it was his spirit with whom they had been communicating. In 1849, Ellen White received a vision concerning this event. I saw that the mysterious knocking in New York and other places was the power of Satan, and that such things would be more and more common clothed in a religious garb. In 1854, Ellen White was given a third vision of the wrapping delusion. I saw that Satan has power to bring before us the appearance of forms purporting to be our relatives or friends who sleep in Jesus. It will be made to appear as if these friends were actually present. The words they uttered while here, with which we were familiar, will be spoken, and the same tone of voice that they had while living will fall upon the ear. All this is to deceive the world and ensnare them into the belief of this delusion. The prevalence of spiritual healers, mediums, and Eastern mysticism in modern society validates Ellen White's prediction that witchcraft would become more commonplace and accepted. And as an article from the New Statesman concludes, it was the curiosity aroused by stories of the knocking that enabled mediumship to come out into the open and become established. Ellen White's disdain for such practices separates her from the realm of psychics and spirit mediums. Although she did foresee the movement's rapid rise in popularity, she condemned it as being of satanic origin. Unlike the Fox sisters, Ellen White spoke as she was moved by the Spirit of God. In a pillar of cloud at the door of the tabernacle, the Lord spoke audibly to Moses and Aaron. And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision, and will speak unto him in a dream. The Bible abounds with warnings, counsels, and prophecies given from God to man through visions and dreams. Joseph, Daniel, and Isaiah and Peter, Paul, and John 
are but a few of the many vessels to whom God gave visions of the day and dreams of the night. Interestingly, the book of Daniel provides insight into what took place when Daniel entered into vision. Daniel experienced an initial loss of physical strength. He later received supernatural strength. His breathing ceased. He was unaware of the earthly events that surrounded him. In the book of Numbers, we find another characteristic which marked the vision of the once true prophet Balaam. His eyes were open. Not unlike these earlier messengers, Ellen G. White received approximately 2,000 visions and dreams throughout her 70-year ministry. J. N. Loughborough, an Adventist pioneer who witnessed Ellen White in vision on roughly 50 occasions, alongside her husband, James White, listed several physical attributes which marked her visions. In passing into vision, she gives three enrapturing shouts of Glory! 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 For a few moments, she would swoon, having no strength. Then she would be instantly filled with superhuman strength, sometimes rising to her feet and walking about the room. She frequently moved her hands, arms, and head in gestures that were free and graceful. But to whatever position she moved, a hand or arm, it could not be hindered nor controlled by even the strongest person. In 1845, she held her parents' 18 and a half pound family Bible in her outstretched left hand for half an hour. She weighed 80 pounds at the time. She did not breathe during the entire period of a vision that ranged from 15 minutes to three hours. Yet, her pulse beat regularly and her countenance remained pleasant as in the natural state. Her eyes were always open without blinking. Her head was raised, looking upward with a pleasant expression as if staring intently at some distant object. Several physicians at different times conducted tests to check her lack of breathing and other physical phenomena. She was utterly unconscious of everything transpiring around her and viewed herself as removed from this world and in the presence of heavenly beings. When she came out of vision, all seemed total darkness, whether in the daytime or a well-lighted room at night she would exclaim with a long-drawn sigh as she took her first natural breath, Dark. She was then limp and strengthless. Incredibly, these features are identical to those experienced by Daniel and Balaam. Ellen White first lost her physical strength and then regained it with supernatural power. She did not breathe. She was unconscious of what was taking place around her and her eyes were open. This eyewitness account undoubtedly describes a supernatural experience. Yet this is not an isolated testimony. The same characteristics have been described by other contemporary sources, including George Butler and Martha Amarden. Yet is this information sufficient proof that Ellen White's visions were from God? Notwithstanding such astounding physical manifestations, one must still tread carefully, for through the prophet Jeremiah, the Lord declares, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination, and a thing of naught, and the deceit of their heart. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain, they speak a vision of their own heart, and not out of the mouth of the Lord. The prophet which prophesieth of peace, when the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that the Lord hath truly sent him. A true prophet will be recognized by the fulfillment of their prophecies whereas a false prophet will be exposed when their predictions fail to come to pass. So what prophecies did Ellen White pronounce, and were they fulfilled in the manner she foretold? Although foretelling the future was not the primary element of her work, Ellen White was given several prophecies which were certainly fulfilled. On the 1st of September 1902, Ellen White wrote, Well-equipped tent meetings should be held in the large cities, 
such as San Francisco, for not long hence these cities will suffer under the judgments of God. San Francisco and Oakland are becoming as Sodom and Gomorrah, and the Lord will visit them in wrath. In July of the following year, 1903, she similarly declared, The judgments of God are in our land. The Lord is soon to come. In fire and flood and earthquake, he is warning the inhabitants of this earth of his soon approach. Oh, that the people may know the time of their visitation. Then, on the 16th of April, 1906, Ellen White received the following vision. During a vision of the night, I stood on an eminence from which I could see houses shaken like a reed in the wind. Buildings great and small were falling to the ground. Pleasure resorts, theaters, hotels, and the homes of the wealthy were shaken and shattered. Many lives were blotted out of existence, and the air was filled with the shrieks of the injured and the terrified. The destroying angels of God were at work. One touch and buildings so thoroughly constructed that men regarded them as secure against every danger quickly became heaps of rubbish. There was no assurance of safety in any place. I did not feel in any special peril, but the awfulness of the scenes that passed before me, I cannot find words to describe. It seemed that the forbearance of God was exhausted and that the judgment day had come. The angel that stood by my side then instructed me that but few have any conception of the wickedness existing in our world today, and especially the wickedness in the large cities. He declared that the Lord has appointed a time when he will visit transgressors in wrath for persistent disregard of his law. Sadly, the city renowned for its alcoholism and sexual immorality continued in its lawless state. And two days later, on the 18th of April, 1906, San Francisco was shaken by a catastrophic earthquake, taking over 3,000 lives, destroying more than 28,000 buildings and leaving 250,000 residents without a home. Historians testify that this quake was as unsuspecting as it was calamitous. Indeed, only two days after Ellen White's vision, almost 300 miles of fault ruptured, resulting in over 80% of the city being destroyed. To this day, the San Francisco earthquake of 1906, including its subsequent fires, is the second deadliest natural disaster in US history. And yet, on the morning of April 18, 1906, there were no observable indications that Earth's crust was about to shift. On the 12th of January, 1861, in a church in Parkville, Michigan, Ellen White received a vision of war. John Loughborough was present during the vision and recorded Ellen White's description of what she saw. There is not a person in this house who has even dreamed of the trouble that is coming upon this land. People are making sport of the secession ordinance of South Carolina, but I have just been shown that a large number of states are going to join that state and there will be a most terrible war. In this vision, I've seen large armies of both sides gathered on the field of battle. I heard the booming of the cannon and saw the dead and dying on every hand. Then I saw them rushing up, engaged in hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Then I saw the field after the battle, all covered with the dead and dying. Then I was carried to prison and saw the suffering of those in want who are wasting away. Then I was taken to the homes of those who had lost husbands, sons, or brothers in the war. I saw their distress and anguish. There are those in this house who will lose sons in that war. Around this same time, Thomas Cobb, while drafting the Confederate Constitution, made plain, The almost universal belief here is that we shall not have war. In March, the Vice President of the Confederacy declared that fear of a deadly collision with the Union was nearly dispelled. Notwithstanding these assuring words, on April 12, 1861, the American Civil War began the gravity of which, as Ellen White foretold three months prior, 
was far greater than anyone could have possibly imagined. Encyclopaedia Britannica estimates that up to 1909, the cost of the war to the nation had approximated the tremendous total of $15.5 billion and the death of probably 300,000 men on each side. How the Roman Church can clear herself from the charge of idolatry, we cannot see. And this is the religion which Protestants are beginning to look upon with so much favor, and which will eventually be united with Protestantism. This union will not, however, be affected by a change in Catholicism, for Rome never changes. She claims infallibility. It is Protestantism that will change. The adoption of liberal ideas on its part will bring it where it can clasp the hand of Catholicism. When Ellen White wrote this statement in 1886, the papacy was regarded by Protestants with far less repute than it is today. Yet she foretold that the two strains would eventually be united. Can we see this union taking place today? The protest is over. The protest is over. Sono più buoni gli evangelici o i cattolici? Brothers and sisters, Luther's protest is over. Is yours? Do you think Luther and Francis would get along? Ich glaube, die würden sich gut vertragen. They'd probably hit it off well. And I think Luther would be quite surprised that the same Catholic Church that excommunicated him is now honoring him in this way. In esta multitud, in este abanico de religiones, hay una sola certeza que tenemos para todos. Todos somos hijos de Dios. So the more we love each other, the more we'll understand each other. If you love Jesus, we're on the same team. Catholic Church, our church is open for everybody, so I like his tongue. I believe that the Catholic Church and the Christian Church are going to come together. We thank God for you. We can also agree on the need to stand up to anti-Catholic bias. And we've got to come together, not only as a nation, but as a world community. We have far more in common than what divides us. When you talk about Pentecostals, Charismatics, Evangelicals, uh, Fundamentalist, Catholics, Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, on, on, and on, and on. Well, they would all say, we believe in the Trinity, we believe in the Bible, we believe in the resurrection, we believe salvation is through Jesus Christ. Maybe we now we're all Catholics again. Every year, an ecumenical meeting is held with the Pope called the Conference of Secretaries of Christian World Communion. The Anglican Church, World Baptist Alliance, the Orthodox Church, Seventh-day Adventist Church, the World Lutheran Church, All the Mennonite of World. these leaders represent literally tens of thousands. This is a miracle, the miracle of the unity has If there is no more protest, how can there be a Protestant church? Chi sono più buoni? Gli evangelici o i cattolici? Besser sind alle zusammen. Protestantism is surely clasping hands with Catholicism. And this unhallowed courtship is leading men and women to give up the very virtues which Protestants once cherished. Ellen White expounds upon this union in her book, The Great Controversy, a striking masterpiece of history and prophecy. These are but a few examples of the events remarkably foretold by this frail woman, and yet, the fulfillment of declared prophecies is not the only marker for a true messenger of God. Christ warns us 
false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Miracles and supernatural appearances will be so hard to gainsay that even the stable Christian might well be deceived. However, Jesus plainly tells us that they are spirits of demons performing signs. In light of this grave warning, what other test can we employ to discern a true prophet of God? To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. In the book of Deuteronomy, Moses reveals that a genuine prophet will always speak in harmony with that which God has already revealed, and will lead men and women to obey the commandments of God. If there arise among you a prophet, or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet, or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you, to know whether ye love the Lord your God, with all your heart, and with all your soul. One might accurately foretell the future, yet if they hath spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, and to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in, then they are not to be regarded as a messenger of the Lord. In light of this principle, did Ellen White speak in harmony with the Bible and the Ten Commandments? Most assuredly. In all her writings, Ellen White emphasizes the unchangeable and enduring nature of God's law, which we are commanded to keep, not of ourselves, but through faith in Jesus Christ. When, through faith in Jesus Christ, man does according to the very best of his ability and seeks to keep the way of the Lord by obedience to the Ten Commandments, the perfection of Christ is imputed to cover the transgression of the repentant and obedient soul. One need only read her inspiring Christian classic, Steps to Christ, which can be found in over 150 languages, to see how highly Ellen White regarded God's immutable law. This book is rich with practical instruction concerning the fulfillment of the law, as well as wise counsel and encouragement for the Christian life. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation, and comfort. Paul tells us that prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. The role of a prophet has ever been to edify and counsel the church, that the church may be thoroughly equipped for the work of ministering to the world. It is through his prophets that God sends messages of warning and entreaty, imploring his backslidden people to turn away from their sins. As Jeremiah proclaimed, the Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and against this city all the words that ye have heard. Therefore now amend your ways and your doings, and obey the voice of the Lord your God, and the Lord will repent him of the evil that he hath pronounced against you. In light of this passage, it is beyond doubt that Ellen White fulfilled her purpose as a prophet. Her nine-volume series, Testimonies for the Church, consists of over 5,000 pages of advice, visions, and counsel on matters of health, family life, church organization, missionary endeavors, and character development. Notwithstanding these invaluable texts, Ellen White's counsel extends far beyond these nine volumes and even beyond the scope of religion itself. Yes, at a time when the standardized treatment of disease involved bleeding, purging, and the use of toxic drugs, God gave Ellen White a revolutionary message of health reform. In 1896, Ellen White published the following statements. The mortality caused by meat eating is not discerned. From the light God has given me, 
The prevalence of cancer and tumors is largely due to gross living on dead flesh. In 2015, a statement released by the World Health Organization revealed that processed meat is patently carcinogenic, meaning that it is proven to cause cancer in humans. This knowledge was drawn from over 800 studies, with the experts deducing that each 50-gram portion of processed meat eaten daily increases the risk of colorectal cancer by 18%. A similarly shocking statistic was also released in Australia that same year. In this study, it was concluded that about one in six colorectal cancers in Australians in 2010 were attributable to red and processed meat consumption. Bear in mind that in 1990, research conducted by Harvard's Dr. Walter Willett led him to proclaim The optimum amount of red meat you eat should be zero. Yet it was really back in 1961 that science caught up with Ellen White's counsel given almost a century before. Following a series of extensive studies, Dr. W. A. Thomas reported, A vegetarian diet can prevent 90% of our thromboembolic diseases, which are clots in veins and arteries, and 97% of our coronary occlusion. Just as Ellen White forewarned, You are worse off for this amount of flesh. If you should come down to a more spare diet, you would be much less liable to disease. Your systems are in a state of inflammation. You are liable to acute attacks of disease and to sudden death. Yet as game-changing as this was, her message on health reform did not end there. In 1864, Ellen White wrote, Tobacco is a poison of the most deceitful and malignant kind. It is all the more dangerous because its effects upon the system are so slow and at first scarcely perceivable. Multitudes have fallen victim to its poisonous influence. They have surely murdered themselves by this slow poison. This counsel was given 100 years before tobacco was recognized as a harmful substance. In fact, throughout the 19th century, The medical world regarded tobacco and cigar smoke as an effective cure for lung disease. The first medical reports linking smoking to lung cancer only began to emerge during the 1920s, and it wasn't until the 1950s and 60s that a series of major studies confirmed that inhaling tobacco can lead to a range of serious diseases. In 1905, Ellen White went on to say, The use of liquor or tobacco destroys the sensitive nerves of the brain. This statement was made 64 years before science recognized that for every glass of alcohol one drinks, they are progressively and yet permanently damaging their brain. Yes, it wasn't until 1969 that Dr. Neasley demonstrated that rather than being merely an end effect seen in alcoholics after years of hard drinking, Brain damage occurs progressively from the first cells destroyed by the very first drink a person takes, and that the damage accumulates relentlessly with every drink he takes thereafter. Remember, it was 1905 when Ellen White said, The use of liquor or tobacco destroys the sensitive nerves of the brain. In 1865, Ellen White also wrote about prenatal influences. The irritability, nervousness, and despondency manifested by the mother will mark the character of her child. If she chooses to eat as she pleases and what she may fancy, irrespective of consequences, her innocent child must suffer because of her indiscretion. In 1954, documented evidence was finally presented in confirmation of this warning. Dr. Ashley Montague declared, For years, scientists have believed that your unborn baby lives an insulated existence protected from all external influences. But this is not true. Mothers undergoing periods of severe emotional stress during pregnancy frequently have infants which exhibit evidences of irritable and hyperactive nervous systems. In 1967, Dr. Leland H. Scott further substantiated Montague's claims by stating that 
Childhood abnormalities such as rickets, nervous instability, epilepsy, and cerebral palsy have been found to result from serious malnutrition in the mother at certain points during the period of pregnancy. It was 1865 when Ellen White warned, In past generations, if mothers had informed themselves in regard to the laws of their being, they would have understood that their constitutional strength, as well as the tone of their morals and their mental faculties, would in a great measure be represented in their offspring. In 1865, Ellen White also relayed a grave vision concerning the poisonous drugs which prevailed at the time, many of which are still used today. In vision, Ellen White was shown several souls, each with unique signs and symptoms, suffering in hospital beds. A gentleman guided her through the harrowing scenes. Of one patient, he said, This is the influence of mercurial preparations. Of another case, This is the result from taking opium. And of another, This is the effect of colomal. In great detail, the guide explained the workings of each drug and the science of its torment upon the body, both physically and mentally. Although society is now gaining awareness of the highly toxic nature of ingredients like mercury, this information was in strict opposition to the medical beliefs of the 19th century. Finally, it was 1869 when Ellen White spoke of electric currents in the nervous system. Whatever disturbs the circulation of the electric currents in the nervous system lessens the strength of the vital powers. The system is vitalized by the electrical force of the brain to resist disease. The notion that our bodies are electrically charged wasn't discovered until 1929 by psychiatrist Hans Berger, and it took five years before the idea was first supported. Dr. Charles Mayo in 1934 declared that electrical charges are the vital force of the brain, heart and nerves. Yet this knowledge was given to a woman with only three years of formal education exactly 50 years before. With all this remarkable beneficial counsel, how can anyone doubt that at the very least Ellen White was granted supernatural wisdom? Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. An accurate study of Ellen White's life will highlight one overwhelming quality, the genuineness of her religion. Her selfless conduct throughout the most trying experiences, including physical trauma, poverty, the death of two of her children, and becoming widowed at the age of 54 points to her authentic reliance upon Jesus Christ. Yes, Ellen White practiced what she preached. As one example reveals, she not only wrote extensively about caring for orphans, but she herself took in numerous orphans from the ages of 3 to 16 years into her home, providing them with motherly care and godly training. Ellen White's witness for Christ was so abundantly clear that at the time of her death, even the common newspapers testified of her good fruits. Here is a noble record, and she deserves great honour. She showed no spirited pride, and she sought no filthy lucre. She lived the life and did the work of a worthy prophetess. Mrs White was a remarkable woman in many ways. She was deeply religious and none who knew her intimately had any doubt as to her sincerity. In the life of Mrs. White is an example worthy of emulation by all. Though of limited education, for the greater part of her long life in poor health, she never faltered, but for 72 years carried and preached the message of Jesus Christ, as understood by her, to the furthermost corners of the earth. She was a humble, devout disciple of Christ, and ever went about doing good, her writings have been published in books, papers, and periodicals, and from her prolific pen has come writings on many religious topics. She was honored and respected by all who appreciate noble womanhood, consecrated to unselfish labor for the uplifting and betterment of mankind. 
Her almost 90 years were full to overflowing with kind deeds, kind words, and earnest prayers for all mankind. This good Samaritan will surely be greatly missed. Her reward will be commensurate with the great good she has done. As is summed up in the book, Prophet of the End. At 17, Ellen Harmon was opposing mesmerists, rebuking fanatics, traveling through Maine. At 18 and 19, she was telling others about Christ in Vermont and Massachusetts. By 22, she was urging that a major publishing work begin. At 25, she was explaining to others, who were twice her age, the intricacies of organizational structure as a growing movement. How did this frail girl with only a third grade education do all this? All this was not the kind of work naturally belonging to a young woman. No committee would ask a very young girl to undertake such a task. And no call of any committee could qualify a youth for such service. But God had called, and men recognized the call. Many may feel that reading the words of a modern-day prophet is unnecessary, or at worst, a waste of time. They may claim to be Bible-only Christians. Of course, the Bible is the only source of Christian doctrine, and all teachings must be in harmony with the Holy Word. However, it is the Bible which teaches that there will be prophets in the last days. It is God who states, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my Spirit. When the Pharisees and lawyers rejected John the Baptist, Luke states that they had rejected the counsel of God against themselves. It was to their own detriment that they denied the words of he whom Christ had called the greatest prophet ever born of a woman. And so it is today. To reject the words of God's chosen messenger is to do so at your own detriment. In effect, you are rejecting the counsel of God against yourself. For it was thus that Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. So what of the stone that was cast at Ellen's head during childhood? Or what of the obelisk placed at her grave? My answer is this. If you can dismiss Ellen White's revolutionary insights on health reform, which were far in advance of the science of her day, as being the result of brain damage, or if you can overlook all her counsels against mysticism, Freemasonry and secret societies in favour of a statue at her grave which was the most common and cheapest during the 1800s, then that is your choice. There will always be hooks to hang your doubts upon, yet when it comes to the seven biblical tests, it can surely be said that this woman passes every one of them. As was our intention, we have permitted Ellen White to speak for herself, sampling and detailing some of her words and works. Such was also done by the well-studied Thomas M. Eliot, editor of the prestigious Atlanta Constitution, and his judgment is as follows. Among the many hundreds of books that I have studied on the subject of religion that inspire heart warmth and enriched faith, none have been of greater help than Ellen G. White's two books, Patriarchs and Prophets and Prophets and Kings. Those books were written not for literary fame or financial reward, but to help heart-hungry humanity learn of God. They make God's dealings with man clear to the most simple-minded reader without bias or sectarianism. I commend these books to all seekers after a clearer knowledge of the righteousness of God. There is one test that remains. It is a test that each soul must conduct for themselves. I challenge you this day to read her works. <laughs>